All right, Dr. Snyder, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be with you all uh, today. I think it's still morning. As Dr. Snyder was saying, we're super duper excited that you all are in this class. We're super excited about the people who have decided to minor in uh, anti-black racism. So if you're still considering a minor, you can take on a minor, join us. I think you all probably had a good time on Tuesday. I think we'll have a great conversation today. And I also wanna say, somebody remind me at the end of class, cause I was meeting with President Pines on, I don't know, early this week, Tuesday, I think. Uh, right after you all had class and he was asking about this class. He's really excited. So make sure that I take a picture so that I can send him um, everybody in the class. And we'll probably do that a little bit later in the semester as well. You see the great Taylor Brown over there who is uh, videoing the professors that are coming in. As Dr. Snyder has told you, we have a power packed team for you all. This will probably be the most unique classroom experience that you have ever had in your life definitely at the University of Maryland. And there are some great classes. But what you get in this class, as Dr. Snyder's probably told you, is several professors across the university coming into this class. Again, I mentioned Dr. Weeks with him. So let's get into it. So we're gonna continue our conversation today about theoretical approaches to anti-black racism. Oh yeah, before I do that though, it is uh, something I wanna do before I get rolling. So we gave you all uh, a series of questions to tell us about yourselves. And I must admit, you all are an impressive group of people. The movies that you all like, the music you all like. I was like, this, this class, I can really rock with this class. So raise your hand, anybody excited that Halloween is the next, maybe one big, ho big uh, holiday? Yeah. Yeah, one of you all must have put Silence of the Lambs as your favorite movie. I know you did, because I, I got super excited. I was like, who in this class loves Silence of the Lambs? And, and then, of course, some people put Get Out, some people put Us. I was like, I can really rock with this crew. And in fact, Halloween season is starting much earlier than it has in the past. I mean, they are already showing Halloween movies on TV. Now, some of that probably has to do with the strike, right? Um, and we want, want to make sure that they get their due. They got to show stuff, so they just started it early. But for a person who loves Halloween, um, I was quite excited about that. My family loves Halloween. So when I come in in November, I think I'll be with you all about two or three classes uh, at the end of November, beginning of December. I'll make sure that I show the picture from my family's Halloween. We do Halloween big every year. I'm talking about like full out costumes, ordering them months in advance. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking about that. Some, <laughs> some of y'all aren't really into it, but those who are, I appreciate that. All right, I wanna start with a question, a couple questions. Um, and again, I'm a sociologist, as you will hear, you'll be exposed to various disciplinary perspectives in this class. That's purposeful for you all to be grounded in that. And so as a sociologist who does intersectional work, who does work across these different areas, you'll see a lot of that come in. Um, I, won't, I will save the health stuff. I'm not getting into that as much, uh, primarily because of Dr. Fryer. And then when I come in at the end of the semester, we'll be talking a lot about policing and criminal justice reform. We'll talk about some of that today, but we'll really be talking about broad theoretical approaches. Question up here. Is the glass half empty or half full on race relations? What do you all think? Is it half empty or half full? Let's just reflect on the past, say, 170 years or so. Is it half full or is it half empty? Yeah. I'd say it's half empty. Half empty. Okay, yeah. why do you think so? Because it's like we make progress during certain periods, but then we regress at other periods. Mm -hmm. it like, it's contradictory to the progress that we made, right? So yeah. It's like we made all this progress in the 60s, but now like in 2023, it's like we're going backwards. There's some... Some places are going backwards, not like the whole mm -hmm. country, but it's just, I feel like we're in this period of like denial over the impact of racism. And yeah. Not good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like racial progress and then we have racial retrenchments, right, on the other hand. Go ahead. I was gonna agree actually with that. Um, I feel like we do tend to regress as we progress, mm -hmm. but I say half empty because we have a lot more work to do to get to where we wanna be instead of saying that we've have accomplished something. I wouldn't put it like that. Okay. Um, I guess I take the side, but okay. I would say it's half full, mm -hmm. but in a way of like 
we've done a lot of progress, but because certain aspects of our society aren't willing to change, it'll never be full. Mm. So it's more of like we've gone really far and ahead of what we've done in the past, but until we fix this last piece, it will never be full. Yeah, I mean, look, all of these are amazing perspectives, and it's really up to you to kind of think about the perspective you have, because really all three of you are saying some similar things. I really like how you put it, Elise. Is it? You said we might never reach the, the glass being entirely full. I think that's a very interesting way to think about it, right? And I think it speaks to the, to the people who are thinking that it's half empty. You know, one of the ways that I think about it oftentimes, maybe the glass changes shape. See, we make assumptions at times that it's just singular, that we're making progress, that we simply go forward. You all mentioned the retrenchment. But maybe sometimes we, we veer off the pathway. And on one hand, we do have to argue in a state like Maryland, when we look at this class, a minor on anti-black racism with the diversity of this class, could be argued this embodies the glass being half full and maybe going up. But then, as you noted, there are other parts of the country where we clearly see something else going on. And maybe, as you all will hear over, over the next 30 minutes or so, is that maybe it's not so much about whether or not it's empty or full, but the way that it changes. Kind of think about it like a candy wrapper. What's your favorite candy? You got a favorite candy? Yeah, I like Swedish fish. You like what? Swedish fish. Oh, Swedish fish. I, what you like? Twizzlers. Twizzler. Oh, I love Twizzlers. I love the Twizzler minis, though, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> see? See the, twi the Twizzler minis? Something special. What you like? You like candy? Kit Kats, ooh, Kit Kats, oh, you can't go wrong. Those four pieces, when you hear them like, like you just, you just hear the sound. I tell y'all my new thing though. My new thing are Jolly Rancher gummies. Have y'all had those? Oh my God, look, I, look, my wife said I got a problem. Like I go, I go around to different stores, I can't find them in the afternoon. And yesterday I found the store, I was like, oh, they got like all the, they got the berry, they got the original. Jolly Rancher gummies, and my wife was like, you got a problem. And I'm like, eh, maybe, my boys like them too. So, so the point is, think about how candy wrappers have changed over time. Think about, say, Coca-Cola as a product, Pepsi as a product. It changes, and sometimes the ingredients change, but what it looks like changes, so it gives us the perception some sort of way that what's actually happening is changing. When there are things that were happening 50, 100 years ago that are still happening today, simultaneously, there are things that are not happening uh, or that are happening today that were not happening 100 years ago. I want to put up a couple of quotes, actually a few. I want to see if you all know who said it. Justice for black people will not flow into this society merely from court decisions nor from fountains of political oratory. White America must recognize that justice for black people cannot be achieved without radical changes in the structure of our society. Anybody got any thoughts? Is that Malcolm X? Uh, not Malcolm X, but good guess though. Let's, let's keep going. I'll, I'll put up some. I won't read them all, but you all can see them. A nation that continues year after year to spend more money on military defense than on programs of social uplift is approaching spiritual death. Any guesses? Who will be talking about the military and spending and all of that? Let me see. True peace is not merely the absence of tension. It is the presence of justice. Yeah. Good guess, not James Baldwin. Y'all, y'all are good. I, I like the guesses. Let, let's keep, let's keep going. There, uh, these are the deepest causes of contemporary abrasions between the races. Loose, loose and easy language about equality, resonant resolutions about brotherhood fall pleasantly on the ear, but for the Negro, there is a credibility gap he cannot overlook. Du Bois, good guess. I'll just go ahead and tell you all. <laughs> These are all MLK quotes. Oh, all MLK. All MLK quotes. Yes, yes. I want y'all to think about this now. James. Think about all the stuff that you've learned about this person and ask yourself if you have seen these quotes. And, and you all are channeling great people, Baldwin and X and uh, Du Bois and others, right? But these, this all, these quotes all came from MLK. Wow. And we got to ask ourselves, that's part of the watering down. If we continue to think about the glass uh, analogy, the watering down of how people think about things. That's part of what a lot of people argue is happening today, centered around what people are learning in schools, the books they have access to. I was in Philly for a conference a couple weeks ago, and there at the University of Pennsylvania, there was a, 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 probably a large 
large uh, desk, probably about this size, with all books that have been banned. And just looking at the books in one place, and I've seen the list and I have most of the books, some of them you're just like, wow, this book is banned. One of them was called The Talk, which is about black parents talking to their kids. It's like, wow, that's a banned book. Um, you, of course, you have Dr. Ibram Kendi's, some of his books were banned. But then you have some other books like To Kill a Mockingbird. Why is that book banned? I mean, most of you are. Raise your hand if you read that book. Yeah. Could you have a reason as to why that book would be banned? How about The Hunger Games? Raise your hand if you watched The Hunger Games, read the books. Why would those books be banned? We have to ask ourselves, see, see, the fact that you all are in this class, purposefully deciding to take this class, and didn't know that these were MLK quotes, think about how much else we actually don't know. That's being hid from us because the knowledge oftentimes flows through books. The knowledge flows through information. If you control information, oftentimes you can control people's minds. And this is one of the quotes that I love from MLK. That's from the March on Washington. Anybody happen to go to the 60th March on Washington? Was at the hmm? March on Washington. You said what? My grandmother was at. Oh, was at the 1963 one? Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Anybody go this past weekend? So did, raise your hand if you knew that the 60th March on Washington was happening this past weekend. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, it was great. I was actually on the 50th March on Washington planning committee. But this particular quote is one of my favorite from MLK because he said it at the March on Washington. And as great as the statement is about um, individuals coming together and his children being able to walk hand in hand, oh, that's phenomenal. Again, that's represented in this classroom in terms of diversity, racial diversity and pluralism. That doesn't always translate into laws and policies. Those are different things, right? But he said, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was, was to fall heir. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that quote. I want y'all to think about this. Two people, three people, including Dr. Snyder. So two of you all. This was from the March on Washington. This was part of his I Have a Dream speech. His point was that in order to get to equality, we first have to address equity. And in order to get to equity, we have to make a people whole who have historically been marginalized and disenfranchised. And what he was fundamentally talking about were reparations. He said there's no way to make people whole unless we address reparations. Reparations that have been given to Jews for the Holocaust, for the roughly six million Jews that were murdered and persecuted in Germany. And other, a lot of individuals were complicit in that. Of course, we could think about Native American and indigenous genocide that has happened on these lands where they have received reparations. We have Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II, who were stripped out of their homes, their businesses, their schools and locked up simply because of their ethnicity. They were given reparations, mind you, decades later. So when we think about this, the United States is not against reparations. The United States is against reparations for black people. That's part of why we specify anti-black racism. Because when we think about it in that way, we fundamentally see that the United States has actually given reparations to a lot of groups of people. But for some reason, it hasn't for black people. Why would that be? We're going to talk about that. And of course, this is the National Civil Rights Museum where MLK was assassinated. Um, my lineage goes to, goes to this place. I'm actually originally from Tennessee, from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Anybody from Tennessee? Anyone from the South that's not Maryland? Because y'all do know Maryland South, right? Like y'all, I just want to be clear. For some of you Maryland people, y'all try to act like Maryland in the South, but <laughs> Maryland is. Like anytime all the bread leaves the grocery store and people don't go to school because it might snow, you in the South, right? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how it lets you know. Where, where you from? Georgia. Georgia, what part of Georgia? Brunswick, Georgia. Oh, awesome. So I grew up in Atlanta in Stone Mountain. That's where I spent my elementary school years, and I'm originally from Murfreesboro, Tennessee, and I went to college at the University of Memphis um, in Tennessee, in West Tennessee. And then I went to grad school in Indiana. Then I went to, um, then I went to grad school in Indiana. I then went to Germany, taught at the University of Mannheim, learned a lot about 
what happened with Jews and the Holocaust to really study just that level of persecution and violence and hate and think about the way that Germany has tried to repair that harm. And they've done a much better job than others. And then came back to Indiana, went to the University of California, Berkeley, where I did a postdoctoral fellowship with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Then I've been here for about 12 years. So that is kind of my professional biography. The National Civil Rights Museum, I've done several things with them, including being on an advisory board now where we are actually, so if you've ever been there, if you've seen people standing on the top up here, and it's actually over here where this is, where he was assassinated, people say the shot came from over here. So Jesse Jackson and others were pointing across. And they haven't done much with that space across where the shot supposedly came from. And there are some conspiracy theories with that that we could talk about. But the point is that I'm on an advisory committee that is helping to completely redesign that space where the bullet came from. And it's just an honor to be able to serve and do it in that way, particularly in a city that I call home. The thing about Memphis that's interesting, every year, on MLK's uh, holiday in January, because he was assassinated in April, on April 4th, we would walk from a slave auction block, because in Memphis there's a huge river. You know, nothing happened without rivers. That's the reason why if you look at cities, Philadelphia and New York, and even in the South, Memphis and others, they're all connected to water, right? That was how people transported stuff. We still do, right? We transport things uh, via boat, because planes get really heavy. Um, and so, we would go from this slave auction block where Africans will be brought from slave ships off of the river, put on a slave auction block and auctioned off. We would go from there to the Lorraine Motel where the National Civil Rights Museum is to reclaim that space and actually then talk about MLK's legacy. And I remember riding back to campus, we would just be, you know, just excited about change and equality and what, what could actually be. And we will pass a Nathan Bedford Forrest statue that was outside the courthouse. Anybody know who Nathan Bedford Forrest is? Yeah, he's the founder of the Ku Klux Klan. Right, he's one of the founders of the KKK. There was a statue up in Memphis on the street when you would pass by it. Now, um, activists and organizations have now got that removed, but then they moved it to a museum, which personally I don't see anything wrong with. I, again, I think that the history should be preserved. It depends on how we highlight it. Um, just to make a, a link, you all know the Justins that are in Tennessee, the state legislatures who got banned from the state legislature. Y'all familiar with that? All right, if, if you're not, look it up. I, I, don't, I don't have time to go into all the detail. But the point that you all might not know with that is, of course, there were three people who were protesting guns in the state of Tennessee. This was right after a school shooting at, um, at a private school where some children were murdered. And uh, they were protesting guns. They said, we don't understand. So in the state of Tennessee, this is what's fascinating. And this has always been the case growing up. You can walk, I remember being 18, walking into a huge expo, like a huge warehouse. Just walking in, me and one of my friends just buying guns. We didn't have to show ID. We didn't have to have background check, nothing. We just walk out with that. That is still the case today. You can just open carry. You don't have to have any, any sort of credential or anything to do that. Now, I say that to say that's part of what the Justins were protesting. Justin Peterson, Justin Jones, one who is from Middle Tennessee, one who is from West University, which is a historically black college in Nashville, and then he went to Vanderbilt. What people don't know, and here goes the Nathan Bedford Forrest connection, is that when he was an undergrad and going to Vanderbilt, he actually did a sit-in and a protest at the state capitol and got the Nathan Bedford Forrest bust, like the head of Nathan Bedford Forrest, removed from the Tennessee state capitol. That thing was still there just up to a few years ago. Wow. What do you think that means when you walk in there? And Tennessee is not the only state. I'm only talking about it in the context of some recent things that have happened in the legacy of MLK. So these are just some connections, things for you all to know. Um, I edited a book with Dr. Holden Mahmoudi, who is the Baha'i Chair for World Peace. They do amazing events here on campus. Um, I'm sure Dr. Snyder will tell you about some because the Anti-Black Racism Initiative um, is co-sponsoring some of those, and those will be opportunities for you all to go to. But one of the things that we highlight to build on what Dr. Snyder shared on Tuesday about how we think about racism is that when we specifically talk about systemic racism, systemic racism is how racism operates through our social institutions. 
It's called systemic when we think about systems. We could also think about structures, right? Structural racism, systemic racism. And systemic ra racism argues that racism is embedded in our policies, practices, and procedures, and oftentimes work to benefit one group of people over another. In this case, white people over people of color. But when we talk about systemic sexism, for example, it would be similar, and it would be benefiting men, or particularly people who are cis and straight, over other groups. And it's embedded in the policies, practices, and procedures in the way things operate. And oftentimes it operates in very subtle ways. And we're gonna get into that and talk about that quite a bit. So racism over time has been intentionally built into the systems that organize our society. Law enforcement, banking, education, city planning, medicine and housing. It can also be found in organizations that give power and provide a sense of belonging, including clubs and churches. For example, if you're on this campus, have you ever asked yourself as, as nice as Greek row is, why only certain organizations are there, not others? You probably ask yourself that. These are some of the ways that these things happen over time. Dr. Snyder showed a series of clips for things that have happened on this campus that sometimes center in those spaces where we see the hoarding of power. And it oftentimes profoundly negatively impacts, has a negative impact on the ability of marginalized communities to succeed and thrive. Now, I wanna talk about, I'll go back and let you all get this, but I'm gonna go ahead and start telling these stories. 40 acres and a mule. Let's start in 1865. Let's actually go to 1863, okay? Now, we hear 1863. I remember when I was y'all's age. I would hear a year like that. Honestly, I would hear the 1960s and be like, that is so long ago. Like, that just sounds like ancient time. Oh, they used to look at black and white TVs. Like, what the heck are they doing? And for y'all, y'all are probably like, y'all used to li like, listen to cassettes? What the heck is that? And CDs. Like, we don't even talk about CDs no more. They're just like, like at least albums have, have become nostalgic. People get albums, scratching albums, collecting them, all of that. But CDs are just like a, a thing people don't do anymore. So nonetheless, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln, we're in the Civil War, and really we go to 1861 as well, so early 1860s, he starts to initiate the Emancipation Proclamation. Okay, Emancipation Proclamation is the presidential proclamation that helped to free enslaved black people. Okay, now this had been going on pretty much since 1619. One of the arguments that people like to make is people like to say, oh, well, other groups were enslaved too, right? The Irish or other groups. No, no, they weren't, not exactly. What, what, what was supposed to happen is that in exchange for your voyage and your trip, to the New Americas, to actually New England. That's the reason why the New England area is called New England. Y'all get it, right? England, New England, all right. Um, so, you know, a lot of people just thank the Patriots, and I'm like, that's not, like, it's a reason why they're called that, right? And the reason why they look like they do. So, nonetheless, coming to New England, to the Americas, as part of that voyage, in exchange, you would have to work for seven years as an indentured servant, very different from a slave, and then, not only are you free, but you get 40 acres and a mule, okay? So by an exchange for this voyage that you elected to be on voluntarily, you work for seven years, you have your place, you do all that, but you give your time and your service to helping to build this, and then you get 40 acres and a mule. That was what happened to some white people when they came over. For black people, people in the new America started saying, wow, we're making a lot of profit off these folks. Can we, in, is there a way to continue to get it for free? And then that's when we started having the uh, transatlantic slave trade. And you know that this wasn't just coming to the United States. The Caribbean, South America, the African diaspora as a whole is huge. And this is the reason why, and even though it doesn't completely always map on the skin tone, but why the African diaspora runs throughout really this Western part of the world in terms of how we think about this. So the 40 acres and a mule, came from, at the end of the Civil War, General Sherman, white man, mind you. See, see, there are a whole bunch of white people that have done amazing things to push toward racial equity. But I want you to think about, could you name a top five? Could you even name a top five of white people that you like, they did some amazing stuff, yeah. Bernie Sanders. But Bernie, Bernie would be a recent one. Bernie would be a recent one. What else? Any, anybody got, got names? Right, you like that's no, no. no. So th this is this is this is important. This 
Oh yeah, yeah, he yeah, Bern, Bernie Bernie was in the scene. Bernie Bernie, Bernie's something else. I've, I've met him before, and he, he's just like that. And so, oh, yeah, yeah, you got excited. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I met Bernie, Ava. He's, yeah, he, he's just like that. Like, yeah, you know, and, and I think part of his, um, his angst that, that we see come through comes from just um, his vile for the lack of progress, right? So my overall point with, with you all's inability to collectively name these names is the way that people that control your history the way that people have controlled your knowledge. There are a whole bunch of people who have done things. We gotta ask ourselves why we don't know, yeah. right? Go ahead. William Lloyd Garrison. Yeah, I mean, yeah, so, so there were definitely some people during the Civil War, and, and Garrison's one, General Sherman, who I mentioned as another. General Sherman said, we have to make uh, formerly enslaved black people whole. This is at the end of the Civil War. Yeah. He said the 40 acres and a mule is what people were promised when they came over. So he issued, uh, he issued Field Order Number 15. Field Order 15 was the legislation that was supposed to give black people their 40 acres and a mule. But then it quickly dissipated. Never happened. Not only did that not happen, let's go move on to the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau was supposed to be, as you see, provide food, clothing, education, and job training to free slaves. Really what it was, it was supposed to be a large government bank where formerly enslaved black people who, because first of all, let me tell you why the 40 acres in the mule didn't happen. Not only was it just about racism, right? It was also about the economics of racism. You gave black people 40 acres in the mule. Who for the last 250 years had been in the fields? Black people. black people. Who you think know how to farm the best then? Black people. black people. So you had racist white people saying, we can't do that. They know how to do everything, mm -hmm. right? And that was part of it, is because the land you know, as people say, God ain't making no more land. There could be waters recede and we, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on with, with the environment and the climate. But overall, land continues to be valuable. It's one of the few assets that appreciate. Y'all know what appreciation means? Mm -hmm. Meaning the value goes up. And so, so then we go to the Freedmen's Bureau. All these black people putting their money into this government bank. The bank just goes defunct. Similar to what happened with that bank on the West Coast that was all wrapped up in yeah, yeah, similar to that. So now all these black people's money is just gone. This late 1800s, money just gone. Homestead Act, this was set up to essentially be the 40 acres in a mule for black folks. Passed on 1866, look at the time frame. You know, 1865, slavery formally ends, and then we have 1866 immediately after, 46 million acres of public land for sale in 160 acre plots. Look at the areas. Enslaved spots, Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Mississippi, heading west, right? But instead, before it got too far, the law was actually repealed just a year later. Until 1986, you see all that red land? That's the Homestead Act. That primarily went to white families, that black families and other people of color did not get, even though the legislation was originally set up for enslaved black people. So uh, the, the theme, one of the themes I want y'all to get is not only did black people not get something they were promised, but white people then got something else on top of that. Are y'all understanding the theme? So the gap doesn't just go like this. Gap doesn't just go like this. The gap goes like this. And it's through policies and legislation that it's happened. Did, did y'all used to watch uh, Wild Wild West movies? Maybe with your grandparents, great grand, great granddaddy, or something like that. I know I did. My granddaddy loved westerns. He loved watching westerns. Westerns were all about these people. If you were like me, I'd be watching westerns and I'd be like, so they just pop up on land and decide they want to be the sheriff? Like I'm trying to like they just decide this is they land. Like I'm gonna put a bank right here, right? This is gonna be my land right here. Well, not only was some of this land Native American land, particularly going through Oklahoma and all that, but then this was Mexico. Like we act like that it wasn't another country <laughs> that just supposedly we just got it, right? So it's complicated. So as all this was heading west to claim this land, this is the reason why, so y'all know the Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt University, right? One of the best universities in the, in the country. What they owned was the railroad that heads west. How much money do you think you get when you own the railroad? See, you know, I met this guy at this thing a few years ago. Um, I know that's so like general, but this guy at this thing. But I met this guy at this thing, 
and he said at this event, oh, part, oh yeah, this event was cool because I actually met, um, I actually met Knight who owns Nike, but that, that's a whole nother thing. So that, that was the cool thing for me, but I meet this guy and we're talking about air conditionings and heaters, you know, like grown, like homeowner stuff that y'all, anybody in here own a home? All right. Yeah, besides Dr. Snyder and Dr. Fry. Yeah, yeah the, uh, home ownership is a big deal. We're gonna talk about that in a second. It's, it's, it's amazing. But it's hard, but it's, but it's worth it because the land hopefully appreciates, unless you're in certain areas, but we'll get to that in a second. So anyway, we start talking about air conditionings, air conditioners and heaters, right? And I'm like, yeah, I think I'm gonna have to, re you know, again, old people stuff. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to replace my heater and air conditioner, they don't make Freon no more. Like, you know, all these kind of weird conversations. And, um, he said, yeah, he said, my, my company, we make the parts. And I said, oh, for which company? Like, let me, let me know so then I'll make sure that I get, get something from that company. He said, no, I don't think you understand. We make the parts, like all of the parts for any air conditioning and any heater before the companies sell it to you, they buy it from us. I was like, wow. So like all of them, he said, all of them. I say all that to say, what do you think that looks like when you get in on the ground floor like that? What do you think that looks like? How do you think that operates? Let's fast forward a little bit. Let's go to World War II. Anybody know who this person is right here? Yeah. Um, oh, you good, yes. Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents. Y'all know Roosevelt is the reason why we actually have term limits. Anybody know how many terms he served? Three. Four. Yep, he served four, and, and um, that's the reason why we have term limits, and if he hadn't passed away, he might have still gotten sick and not passed away, probably. <laughs> if he was, yeah, if he was still alive, he might still be around. Yeah, I mean, pro probably so. And, and partly because to establish what we know to be the white middle class today. And I say the white middle class, not just the middle class, and I'm gonna unpack this in a second. Now I think we could call it the middle class and the legacy of this, but everything that came out of this, even though Roosevelt is one of my favorite presidents, he made a fatal flaw that I'm gonna mention in a second. So why was he so famous? I want y'all to look at this. Roosevelt becomes president and all of a stock market crashed. Y'all know the famous stock market, 1929. Nobody had anything. Unemployment was horrible, right? This is the percentage of unemployment for non farm workers, meaning, could you imagine if the unemployment rate in the United States was close to 40%? You imagine the pandemonium that would be going on? So it hits that, what does he do? They strike a deal about the New Deal, which I'll break, break up in a second. The Supreme Court declares some of it unconstitutional, but then part two began, just look at the drop in unemployment, and in a decade, unemployment ends up being record lows. Right? What did he do? Well, let's talk about what he did. The big thing he did was he just put, ton, just put tons of money into, uh, into people's ability to get government contracts. The great correction, the great contraction, just investing in people's ability to apply for government contracts. Raise your hand if your parents or one of your relatives is a government contractor, does work for the government does anything with the government. Raise your hand high. Yeah, so that's probably like half the class. Y'all parents probably work for government contractors, y'all don't even know. Because the companies are, they're like, oh yeah, we're primarily a government contractor, but it's their own company. A ask your parents and your family about it. The whole point is, he and his team were smart because they did that, and look at what happened all of a sudden. That all of a sudden, private investment recovered so quickly, and then it just skyrocketed again. What exactly is skyrocketing? Well, what did he do? First thing he did was he created Social Security. Social Security set minimum wages, regulated work hours, and established unions, things that we take for granted today, or at least know about. I mean, we know that minimum wages should be higher. But before that, that wasn't the case. Like, salaries were just all over the place. But here goes the whole point about Social Security. All these people started getting Social Security. Now, I want you to think about this. If you got grandparents, great-grandparents, they probably talk about their Social Security checks. Oh, I got my Social Security check. In two years, I can apply for my Social Security. Like, I, like that's how they talk, right? Uh, my mama just got hers. Like, it was like, it was like a birthday up in the house. I was like, all right. 
Um, but of course, they have been working and their tax money went in to build their social security. So it's their money. It's essentially like a retirement. Here goes the whole point as you see here with the second point. Social security didn't include two occupations, domestic work and farm work. Why is this significant? 75% of black people in the South were in these two occupations. Why were black people still in these two occupations? Because these are the two occupations that black people were primarily relegated to. The same occupations that they were engaging in during enslavement. Domestic work and farm work. So you exclude these occupations, what do you think that means for a group of people? And again, we gotta think, people oftentimes overestimate the percentage of black people in the population. How many people know what percentage of black people are in the US, roughly? Just blurt it out, y'all say it. Yeah, about 13%. You ask some people, they'd be like, it's 20, 25% of them. It's like, nah, like, that's an indicator. If you ask people what percentage of different racial groups and they completely overestimate a group, that lets you know kind of what they think about that group because by overestimating the size of a group of people, that suggests the level of threat that you actually perceive from them. Not just physical threat, but economic threat, political threat, cultural threat. Same thing happens with Asian Americans. What percentage of the country is Asian Americans? People are like, it's like 50%. It's like, no, no, it's not. It, it suggests the perception of the threats that people have about jobs, about voting, about culture. So that's Social Security. Let's go to the GI Bill. GI Bill was established after World War II. Why is this significant? Because during World War II, we still had the draft. Eight out of 10 men born during the 1920s were drafted to go to war. Considering the high rate of marriage at that time, close to 80% of all American families benefited from the GI Bill because these veterans who fought in World War II, overwhelmingly who fought to stop Nazi Germany, came back to America, they had served our country and they were due certain things. Things that they work for, things they sacrifice for. As a person who comes from a military law enforcement family, these are things that they sacrifice for. My granddad served in two wars, Purple Heart, Bronze Star, has presidential commendations, all of that. My mom got into West Point in the 1970s as a black woman. Like this is my family legacy. So I take, I really think about this in a slightly different way. The GI Bill was aimed to, as you see, re reintegrate veterans returning from the war. And those government contracts that I showed you on the last slide, people were, people in companies, organizations were getting money to study the large percentage of the U.S. population. Who do you think got those government contracts? Right? So, what did, what did the uh, GI Bill do? The GI Bill gave veterans uh, tuition grants to go to college. They had to pay for college. Gave them money for their kids to go to college. Their kids didn't have to pay for college. Gave them grants to put down payments on homes. They didn't have to pay down payments on homes. Gave them grants to start up small businesses. Y'all know how when you're watching like a political debate or politicians, they always talk about small businesses, small business. Small businesses are part of the backbone of the United States. But really what they're signaling to are a specific group of small business owners who are part of the legacy of the GI Bill. Why is everything I said racialized? Because what I just mentioned only went to white veterans. Black veterans did not receive it at all. And in fact, they couldn't even go to a place like University of Maryland. Do you all know who this building is named after? Anybody know? Yeah, anybody know who he is? So Clarence and Perrin Mitchell. The Mitchell Administration Building at the bottom of the hill is named after Clarence Mitchell. That was Perrin Mitchell's older brother. Perrin Mitchell was a civil rights activist, but he was also the first black congressman uh, at or below the Mason-Dixon line. And he is an alumni of the University of Maryland, and he was the first African-American to take graduate courses, um, all of his courses on campus to get his degree. Got that degree in 1952. Which department did he get that degree in? The Department of Sociology. That's the reason why this building is named after him. And this is a recent thing, y'all. I was here and was actually part of a task force that helped to do a commission, helped to have a commission and a study to actually get this building named after him. And one of the reasons why the stadium is named with his name now and not Bird Stadium, which if you're from Maryland or if your family's from Maryland, they will probably still call it Bird Stadium, is because we had an event right out here when we um, um, changed the name of this building. And 
the Mitchells stood up at the time, President Lowe's president, and they said, we don't understand how you can have a Mitchell at the top of the hill and a Mitchell at the bottom of the hill, but the person who stopped all them from coming, from taking courses here, his name is on a stadium in the middle of them. And the stadium name changed within a few months, right? Those are the kind of moments that you wait for that happen, right? So I say all that to say, black people didn't get this money. So this is the reason why, historically, why there are so many historically black colleges and universities because they couldn't go to University of Maryland. So they were like, well, shoot. Well, then we can create our own universities. And this is why the critique that people have on HBCUs, I pull back because the critique is that, oh, well, they don't have resources. They're not running efficiently. Well, if you never got the government money that a University of Maryland got, where do you think you would be? If you're so far behind the A-ball or like a large settlement that happened here in the state of Maryland where Bowie State and Morgan and Coppin and Eastern Shore were establishing programs and then here come the big dogs like us coming in creating the same program, where do you think students gonna go? So that was a multi, multi-million dollar lawsuit that's happened since y'all been living. It's been in the past 10 years that this happened. So, so we had the GI Bill. Again, 80% of families impacted. What happened after that? Ira Cass Nelson, who was he? He's a historian. Uh, as you saw his book a little while ago, uh, When Affirmative Action Was White, powerful book where he unpacks this to talk about how we actually need to think about affirmative action. Of course, the Supreme Court just ruled that race cannot be used as a primary factor in uh, the selection of individuals who are admitted to a university. Um, people are still sorting through those details and I'm sure we'll talk more about that. But why, how did we get here? We got here not because of enslavement. The, the, our, our country really didn't deal with that. It's never dealt with that. That's the reparations debate. Affirmative action is about the New Deal, right? And what happened with affirmative action is we had corrective justice. Corrective justice identifies interventions that remedy previously unjust decisions, which is what that was, that made existing patterns of distribution even more unfair, which is what it did. Again, there was already a gap, a racial gap, the New Deal, veterans coming back from World War II, not just the Tuskegee Airmen, but a whole bunch of black folks and other folks that were fighting in the war side by side, coming back, should have got the same thing. America had the chance to correct it and did not. And what did it do? Widen the gap. After slavery ended, had the chance to make a correction. 40 acres and a mule. What did it do? Widen the gap. So the point is, to the point about the glass being half empty, every time progress happens, there's racial retrenchment. Right? Corrective justice comes up. What did John F. Kennedy do? In 1961, for the first time, he used affirmative action by instructing federal contractors to take affirmative action to ensure that applicants are treated equally. At the time, it was primarily race, but now it's expanded. But race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Now, it includes all of the marginalized statuses. I also want to make a point here. This legislation came about because of discrimination and racism against black folks. But all marginalized groups now benefited from it, which is probably the way that it should be. The point is, what you'll continuous, continuously hear in this class is that when things have happened to black folks, everybody gets on their backs and tries to ride to the promised land. Just recognize that that is how it happens. That's the reason why people get upset when they make statements like, this is specifically about black people. And people who don't know this history, they're like, no, it's about all of us. They're like, no, this is specifically about black people. That's, this is what they're saying without sometimes even being able to articulate this, this point. And when it comes to affirmative action, affirmative action, who is the group that has benefited the most? Women. Which is perfectly fine and should be happening because we know that with the 19th Amendment, before that, women couldn't even vote. In a, Interesting Tennessee point. Tennessee was actually the state, the last state that voted to ratify the 19th Amendment to give women the right to vote during this women's suffrage movement. The point is, we see all of these intersections coming together. Life is complicated, they're not separate. And particularly when we think about black women, that is an intersection there where they are impacted and not just have a double whammy, because it's not just additive, it's intersectional, it's multiplicative in terms of what happens. So when you hear people say the intersectionality framework, intersectionality, what they are talking about primarily is frequently how race, gender, and sexuality come together, but also social class, other forms of marginalization that are not additive, you're not doing one plus two, it becomes a multiplicative relationship to impact people differently 
based on their ethnicity, based on their sexual orientation, based on their education, social class background, based on their ability. So John F. Kennedy issues this in 1961. This is one of the primary reasons why he was assassinated. You gotta ask yourself, Abraham Lincoln, he was assassinated in DC. Why was he assassinated? Because this dude freed the slaves. John F. Kennedy, one of the primary reasons why he was assassinated. Why? Because he put in place affirmative action and he was gonna do a whole lot more that President Lyndon Johnson ended up doing. Rights Act of 1964, Voting Rights Act of 1965, Fair Housing Act of 1968. Before 1965, black people couldn't vote, y'all. That's not that long ago, right? It's just not that long ago. So what did affirmative action do? Affirmative action def is defined as the policies and or programs to seek to redress, redress is the key word, redress past discrimination through what? Active, active keyword, through active measures to ensure equal opportunity. Affirmative action was about trying to get equity. It was also not about just allowing people to walk in who were unqualified. It has never been that way. Do not let people sit up here and tell you that. And especially for people in this room. If you are in a room, if you walk into a room, you are there because you deserve to be there. Do not let anybody tell you otherwise. Sometimes you might have asked why they there. Like, how you get in here? That's what I'll be asking. I'm like, hey, I know why I'm here. How you, how you get here? Right, tell me how you got here. Why you asking me while I'm here? So affirmative action simply gets people to the door. Once they get to the door, then there are certain credentials that still have to play out. And I don't have super a lot of time to get into, into this point, but we could talk about it more even when I come back later on in the semester, you all can let Dr. Snyder know about that. So I mentioned the 1964 Civil Rights Act. This established, again, that black people and women and other groups should be treated like normal human beings. Y'all, that was 1964. That's just not that long ago. I know it seems like it, but it's just not. It's just not that long ago in terms of how we think about this. And again, why was affirmative action needed? Because of the GI Bill and Social Security. Things that we continue to hold up. How much are we talking about with, with the GI Bill? Several years ago, the GI Bill was worth $82 billion. It is still to this date one of the largest federal government initiatives in American history. Now, nowadays, Black people can actually get their GI Bill stuff. But for the majority of people that were coming up during that time, they actually couldn't. All right, let's go into some, to, uh, some contemporary times. So we had 1964. A lot of people think 1960s, things are good, right? Everybody can go to school together. King's dream has been realized. Well, not exactly. This is DC. Anybody directly from D.C., born in D.C., from D.C.? All right, cool. Yeah, what war is y'all from? Um, war 8. War 8? War 8? War 8? Yeah, all right. So War 8, here we go. So let's talk about it. So for people who don't know the wards, you have essentially, and you can, you can kind of see it here, but you have one, 1 and 2, you have 3, 4, then it wraps around, 5, 6, 7, 8, okay? Okay, Prince George's County is over here. Just to give you all an idea, Montgomery County, you have Virginia, all right, just telling you all where we are. You got the diamond shape. So the darker the colors on this map is where African-Americans are more likely to live. The lighter colors are where non-blacks and whites are more likely to live. All right, so where Brookings is, what, one of the places where I have an affiliation is up in this area, Ward 3, DuPont, Circle. It's really nice over there, right? It becomes like, what do you mean by nice? Well, people oftentimes will say like, bigger buildings, better buildings. Some people will say less crime. You know, when people say something is nice, I always say, what do you mean by nice? Like, nice can mean a whole bunch of stuff. Like, you can't assume you know what people mean when they say it's nice, right? But, all right, let's go to this map. The darker colors over here are where more African Americans are. Fewer African Americans, more whites. This map is household income. The lighter colors are more affluent. The darker colors are less affluent. You could almost take both of those maps, put them on top of each other. That shows the intersection between race and household income. That is today. And what's so fascinating about it, we could go back to the 1960s and we hardly see no change. The darker colors are where more black people are, the, the yellow colors are where more white people are. Housing, segregation, this is how it plays out. 
policies that restrict people from living by each other. And the point is, even when supposedly these policies are gone, we have de facto segregation that oftentimes maintains these things. And how does this spill over? Well, it spills over into this way. What you're looking at is called a dissimilarity index. It's a measure that economists and other social scientists used to know how segregated people are from one another. The higher the bar, so you see zero to 0.8, it goes from zero to one. Think about that as a percentage. So think about five is 50%. What this means is, let's take Atlanta. We got two Georgia boys in here. Let's take Atlanta. Atlanta is about 70%. This means 70% of black and white people will have to move for Atlanta to be integrated. That's what a dissimilarity index means. It means black and white people are living so far apart. And we could, take, we could take other groups too. We could do Latinos, we could do Asians from white people and black people. And in certain places we would see more or less segregation, but overwhelmingly we see large amounts of segregation. And even in some of the places that's slightly lower, like Oakland or Sacramento, uh, some places in Texas where people perceive supposedly that things are just more diverse, simply because there are more groups of people does not mean that people are living in harmony together. Those are two different things. Why does this matter? Because the more segregated places are, the more likely they are to be devalued. And historically, that's been the case. We have Tulsa, Black Wall Street. Raise your hand if you all have heard of Black Wall Street, Tulsa. Okay, so Black Wall Street in Tulsa was just a thriving black community in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Greenwood, Oklahoma, thriving. You, this is all black area. Black businesses, black banks, black hospitals, black homeowners, they just live in their life. Because that's what America told them to do, right? Pull, them, pull yourself up from your own bootstraps. They was like, bet, we can do that. We got it. What happened? Destroyed, bombed, by whom? The police and the military. Racist white people, some of whom are the same people, right? 300 people killed, 35 blocks destroyed. How much money y'all think these people lost? In addition to their lives. Lost. We can go to other places, East St. Louis. Think about all the stuff people say about St. Louis and East St. Louis. Because you know, East St. Louis is actually in Illinois, but you got St. Louis, you got East St. Louis. 6,000 people were homeless, 300 businesses destroyed, 200 people killed. All black areas. Rosewood, Florida, up to 150 people dead. People fled their land, lost their land. Detroit, think about what, oh, people got all kinds of stuff said about Detroit and how bad it is. People forget that all these people were killed simply because they were in a segregated black community that they did not create, but were thriving. There are so many other places all across the country, in New York, in California, in Illinois, in places that people supposedly say, oh, that, that wasn't happening there. Bull crap, next time you're in New York, go to the African burial ground in Manhattan, in lower Manhattan, uh, by where the 9-11 uh, memorial is located. You'll actually see an African burial ground. When they were creating government buildings, CIA, FBI, all of that, they were like, this land is really fertile. Why is it so soft? They got to digging. They found people's bones. Bones from whom? African people. It's called Wall Street because they literally put up a wall at one point to prevent one people from getting to the other side of their wall. Like, the East Coast is not absolved from this. Why is this important? Well, you know how I just showed you that Atlanta, this outside of DC and a couple other places, is supposed to be like this beacon of like black hope, right? It's supposed to be this place where black people go to the promised land and supposedly that's the case. Well, I just showed you how big the dissimilarity index is. I want you to look at this. Atlanta has the largest home ownership gap between black and white people. Largest gap. I want y'all to look at these gaps. So the darker color are for, for black minority neighborhoods, meaning fewer black people live there, predominantly white and other minority groups, and then the lighter color is black majority. Look at those gaps. I mean, we, we could take tons of other cities, but the dissimilarity index, the segregation, maps onto the home values. Over 50% of wealth in the United States is built through home ownership. People then take the equity in that house, meaning, say for example, you buy your house, shoot, let me use here. Goodness gracious, houses are crazy expensive. But let me be modest. Let's say 500,000, here, $500,000 house. You pay down your note, it appreciates as well, so you pay down the amount you owe. Anybody know for a typical loan what percentage you gotta put down on a house? How much? 20%. Now, 20% is a customary 30 year loan. Yeah, some of y'all like 20%. So 20% of 500,000 is now what? Come on, y'all, I know this is social science class, but 20% of 500,000 is what? 
A hundred thousand. Thank you. A hundred thousand dollars that you now have to put down on your house. You hadn't even got to fixing it up yet. Right? 50% of people get their money to build wealth from home ownership because if you buy a house for 400,000, you put in 100, oh, for 500,000, you put in 100, now you owe 400,000 on that. Say after 10 years on a 30 year loan, say now you owe about 300,000, but say your house appreciates to 650. Now you have $350,000 in equity in your house. Say you have two kids and they wanna go to University of Maryland. You take out a home equity line of credit out your house and you say, go to University of Maryland. Go do well. You don't have to worry about your tuition. You did good coming out this house. But all of a sudden, I mean, just imagine if you're in Detroit, no matter who you are. But <laughs> uh, imagine, imagine if you black in Houston, because Houston is one of those other places now. People are like, you black, go to Houston. It's great to be black in Houston. Is it though? I don't know. <laughs> Atlanta, oh, it's great to be black in Atlanta. Is it? I, I don't know. If, I don't know. Right? Maybe in some ways, culturally maybe, culture don't translate over to wealth. Wealth don't pay your bills, or, or, or culture doesn't pay your bills, wealth does, and it definitely doesn't send your kids to college. And it definitely doesn't allow you, when you graduate from college, for your parents to be able to say, you know what, you did well in college, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that $100,000 and put a down payment on your house. Now, you all come out of college, same degree, same grades, you all get the same job, but because of where your family chose to live and what they look like, your wealth profile and your opportunities for what that looks like for you is significantly different than the person sitting beside you. Look at this, blacks in the highest income bracket compared to whites in the highest income bracket got denied for mortgages three times as much. Some people say, oh, well maybe that has something to do with their credit. No, white applicant in the lowest income bracket was more likely to get a mortgage, mortgage loan than black people in the highest income bracket. That, that, that's just wild, y'all. And then it has huge, disparities for um, wealth overall. So the top bar you see for whites over time since 1989, um, which you know early 90s I assume many of you all were being born early to mid 90s so you could kind of track that. And then black people's wealth and what it looks like over time. And that gap and what it looks like. Most of this is wrapped up in housing because then people take that money and then they invest in stocks. So we have that playing out in that particular way. So let's say black person has the money they get, they get to what they're supposed to do. How does this play out? Let's take on the left. That is Abina and Alex Horton. As you can probably see, she's black, he's white. She was there, they had their home appraised. You know, that's when they come and tell you how much your house is worth. They want to sell their house. Come and had their home appraised. And they were like, this, this can't be right. There's no way that our house is selling for this low. They said, could it be, is it race, is it racism? So Alex was like, bet, let's figure it out. So they removed all pictures of Abina's family, removed all pictures of their biracial son. Alex was there at the house, it jumped 40% at the next appraisal, 40%, y'all. 40%, that's, that, that's their son and whatever kids they have going to college. Uh, you have Steven in Connecticut. As you see there, he removed all uh, family photos, movie posters, had a white neighbor stand there for him at the second appraisal. Home jumped over 100,000. It's real money, y'all. D.L. Hughley, anybody know who he is? Comedian? Yes. Do y'all know who he is? Yes. Okay, so I know, I know Dr. Snyder asked you all the other day if y'all know people. This is important for us, so I gotta know. I'm like, do y'all know these people? Am I getting super old? Everybody know, like, kings of comedy. This is D.L. Hughley. All right, anyway. So D.L. Hughley, like, he's a famous dude. He bought a house for $500,000 in California, right? This is California, Southern California, where the stars supposedly are. Gets his appraisal. The bank flagged it. The bank was like, Mr. Hughley, it's, we think something's wrong. The bank issued a new appraisal because they were like, this can't be right. Bank came back $160,000 higher, y'all. This is real money. Happening to real famous folks, not just regular folks. This is how it plays out. And how does it play out with Wells Fargo during the uh, COVID-19 when, again, ask your parents and your, your, your family members this if they refinance during COVID. It's a big deal. 
People's interest rates went, I don't even have time to get an interest rate today, but people's interest rates might have went from five, six, seven percent to half of that or less. Raise your hand if you got a car note. Do you have a car, car note? No. Do, do y'all, raise your hand if you got your license. Y'all got your license? <laughs> okay, I, I just gotta ask, cause so, you know, in Maryland, people take, people take public transit, people don't have their license, people take Uber and all that kind of stuff. Um, all right, well, when, if you get a car note, or anything you ever finance, the interest rates are really, really important, y'all. Always get three options. Go to a big bank, small bank, go to the place, weigh the options. Don't just, don't just get excited and sign. Because the difference between paying 7% and 3% over the course of, say, a $500,000 loan is gonna probably cost you, probably close to $100,000 that you just paying each month. You're not, even, you're not even paying attention to it. Wells Fargo, as you see here, rejected nearly half of their black homeowners. I want y'all to read the headline. Their homeowners. These were people that already had a home loan with Wells Fargo. They already had the home loan. These were people that the bank had already said, yes, you're good enough to, to qualify. And I take this personally because I was wrapped up in this. I had Wells Fargo. And I was like, what the heck is going on? I'm talking about months, y'all. Months going by. Why is that important? Because in 2020 and 2021, the rates were the lowest they've been in decades. If you did not get in then, then you got a little screwed with how the market works. So everybody was like, refinance, refinance, refinance. I was like, what is taking them so long? Now, given who I am and what I do, I was like, look, I gotta, talk, I gotta talk to the person at the top. Oh, well, I'll connect you with a manager. No, I don't, I, don't, I don't wanna talk to your manager. I wanna talk to the vice president of your division. Put him on the phone, tell him to call me. And they did, and we got our stuff situated. There were so many people who couldn't. Now, I say that to say, I also then switched from Wells Fargo. I was like, you ain't keeping my money. Like, I, just, I just don't roll like that, that's crazy. And then this came out, and I was like, what? Me and my wife were like, look, look this is crazy. Because, let me tell you, how, how it affects you and how what Dr. Fryer is gonna talk about in upcoming weeks links. Because that's stress. That stress comes out in physiological ways that affect your mental, emotional, and physical health. Especially when somebody playing with your money. Like think about it, it can be small. You can go to the gas station and you like, yeah, I'm on pump five. I did $10, well, you probably gotta do more than 10 because gas is so high. You do $20 on pump five, but they put you on pump four and it's $40 and you about to blow a gasket in the 7-Eleven <laughs> and they just made a mistake putting in the number, right? People don't play about their money. So what does all this accumulate to? One of my colleagues at Brookings, Dr. Andre Perry, did an analysis and found that homes of similar quality meaning these neighborhoods are similar between black and non-black neighborhoods, that the black neighborhoods, each home was roughly 23% less, roughly $50,000, $48,000 per home, amounting to $156 billion in cumulative losses for black homeowners. How does this function for education? Well, as you all probably know, property values are linked to school funding, right? The whole thing that everybody gets money and we're gonna have, uh, you all are gonna have Dean Kimberly Griffin come in from the School of Education right across the way. Other scholars from the School of Education come in. So I'll save some of this for them. They'll be talking about this broadly, but also what happens in the classroom as well. Is that part of what this leads to is a gap between mostly white and mostly non-white school districts. Now, if you listen to the media, they would say, oh no, black, black schools get way more money. No, they don't. The, gov the federal government is trying to make up this gap from local property taxes. Schools are in no way equal, and I don't have to tell y'all that, y'all know this, especially in a state like Maryland, because outside of Maryland and Massachusetts, these are the best schools in the country. And if you happen to go to one, it's probably one of the reasons why you're here. And if you didn't go to one, then you just hella, hella smart and work super hard, to be honest with you. Not saying the people aren't smart and work hard who, who go to other schools, but there are differences there. And as you see here, accumulates $23 billion. What are we starting to talk about? Cumulative disadvantages and cumulative advantages based on where you fall. This was from the early 2000s when you all were growing up in elementary school. And y'all were for the most part, right? Based on your age, yeah, going to, all right. All right, so, so I want you to look at this. Property taxes, I want you to look at this. Up until we had No Child Left Behind, which was roughly 2001, you had a similar percentage coming from state aid and property taxes. After that, all of a sudden, property taxes started really driving how much money goes to schools. And not only that, then the schools that didn't do well got their money cut 
What sense does that make that the schools that aren't doing well now get less money? Let's talk about work. Let's talk about what happens when you get your degree. Y'all go to a state college, University of Maryland, great school. Phenomenal school. Again, congratulations for being here. Most of y'all are upperclassmen. Y'all like, yeah, I've been here for a while. I've taken this class. It's an elective. Thought it was exciting. I'm about to get out of here. Raise your hand if you're graduating this year. Woo, look at y'all. Congratulations. Y'all are great. For those of you that will be with us for a few more years, maybe you got time to think about this gap even more. You go to a state school, there's a racial gap in the percentage of individuals who get called back for a job and ultimately hired. If you're black, this is your percentage. If you're white, this is your percentage. Now, people say, oh, what about the Ivies? I'm sure you got friends who went to the Ivies or, you know, what people call the, the Southern or almost Ivies, the Dukes and the Emory's and Vandy's and all that, but Stanford, Harvard, all that. Of course, the percentage goes up, but the gap basically stays the same. Not only does this gap and this gap exist, I want y'all to look at this gap to this gap. So, white people who went to a state college almost had the same percentage and the likelihood of getting a job as a black person who went to an Ivy League school. We can see what the currencies mean in different ways in the exchanges. This is Diva Pager, sociologist, who uh, passed away from uh, a rare form of cancer recently, but she left us with amazing work. She sent out workers to try to figure out how does a criminal record affect people's ability to get a job. What she found truly shocked her. Not only, all right, not only did whites with out a college degree be more likely to call back and hire more than other groups. But I want you to look at this. Whites with a criminal record were more likely to be called back and hired for jobs compared to blacks without a criminal record. Blackness is so detrimental to people's successes that white people with a criminal record are hired over them. Goes against everything we know to exist. So part of thinking about this is thinking about social welfare policy and how we think about things moving forward. Social welfare policy is thinking about principles and frameworks that seek to optimize individual agency. This is in line with the United States in terms of how we think about what it means to pull yourselves up from the bootstraps and what it means to be upwardly mobile. So we can think about it in that way. And part of thinking about this is in some cases from the government, it's about action or inaction. Sometimes there are things they need to do. Other times there are things that they don't need to do. There are some people who think that recent Supreme Court rulings are rolling us back. When we think about affirmative action rulings, when we think about the repeal of Roe versus Wade and the ability for women to choose. Of course, there are another group of people who think that these things need to be happening. And part of what they think is that some sort of way that affirmative action policies and the way that they're set up discriminate against other groups. Not just white people, but Asians as well. And research doesn't exactly bear that out. One of the leading scholars is Janelle Wong, Dr. Janelle Wong. She's a professor here on campus. If you have the chance to take a course with her, I recommend that you do, or at least look up some of her articles and read about it. Um, and so part of thinking about then welfare policy is that welfare policy is thinking about a series of things. Thinking about food, housing, education, shelter. And part of thinking about this is thinking about what does actually justice look like? And the whole point is there's a difference between equity and equality. Equality is giving people the exact same thing. It's saying, you get A, you're gonna get A. Equity says that we're gonna help people become whole. We're gonna give them what they need to make up a gap in what they've been given historically and currently versus what other people have received. And it's important to note that People who view things as a zero one sum game, meaning that if you get something, that means I get something less. If they think that way, then they are more likely to think that pursuits for equity is discrimination against them. Instead of realizing that what research actually documents, let's just take integration, housing integration, school integration. Research on integration in schools and in housing shows they're more integrated schools. Students learn more. They become more holistic. They are also more likely to go on to post-secondary education. People who live in integrated communities actually have higher home values. You put all this together, part of this benefits everyone when you lift all boats. Relative to trickle-down economics, which research documents that that doesn't happen. 
So I know that you all wrote about critical race theory and I was hoping to get to it, um, but I'm sure that we'll be covering it coming up. So thank you all for being here, it's exciting. We will see you all next week. Thank you, Dr. Ray. Thank you all. Bye.